this computer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Intro to Celtic Bay Magic. Um, so the, I wanted to start the class off with letting you know um, which book is one of my favorites for beginners. And remember, this is definitely a beginner's book. If you are somebody who already knows about Celtic Fae and you're looking to expand your knowledge, this is probably not the book for you. But if you are just entering the world of Celtic Fae magic and you would like to um, have a book that is for beginners, this book, which is called A Beginner's Guide, to Fairies and Nature Spirits by Teresa Mori is actually a fabulous book. I really love Teresa Mori as an author. She's done some books that like I probably wouldn't recommend necessarily for like educational purposes, um, but all of her books for educational purposes are just extremely well explained. She explains everything so well. She starts at the very, very beginning. She is really, really amazing for people who are just starting out. And I also suggest one of her other books um, called Herbs for Witchcraft and Ritual. Um, it's amazing. So this book, it's also a really small book. And it's a really small book that really, really jumps into describing Celtic fey magic. Um, if you are looking to explore the other cultures, that also have beautiful representations of the fae that go by many different names, such as the Jinn or the Aziza. Um, she is not the author for you. She focuses on Celtic traditions. She's also from Ireland. And uh, so if you are looking for Celtic traditions, she is amazing for that. And we are going to read some of the quotes out of her books today as well. Something else that I wanted to show you guys as we start class is um oops should have had this prepared but um on the website which is where we are going to start with our lesson for the day is a study guide section that already includes so much information about celtic fey also so much information that comes from this book. So let me share screens really fast. Um, share screens. So if you go to the website and you go to the study guide section, and you scroll down to Fey Magic. You will find an entire section on the Fey Magic that we have already gone over. Remember that the study guide section of the website only covers things that we have already gone over in classes at the academy. Um, so you have Celtic Fey mythology, Jinn mythology, which we are not going over today, but they are. Um, a traditional spirit from the Middle East, uh, the Fae from the Middle East, if but Fae is a Celtic term, so I don't necessarily like calling them the Fae from the Middle East, but just so people kind of understand that um, the mythology of the Jinn is, has similarities to the European Fae, but the Jinn from the Middle East are a much older spirituality and tradition a much older folklore and a much older mythology than uh, Celtic Fae. And you also have Aziza mythology and an introduction to a Jinn mythology class presentation. So today we are going over Celtic Fae mythology. So this actually, um, on this page, you will see if you go to the bottom and it is, there's a lot of information here. <laughs> which we are definitely going to cover most of this in class today. But you will see at the bottom, the cited book is A Beginner's Guide, Fairies and Nature Spirits by Teresa Mori, which is this book. So the very first thing that I wanted to do for class today is um, ask you 
who are and what are the Celtic Fae? Which remember that these would be Fae that um, the mythology originates from Celtic societies. Um, usually that is talking about Ireland and Scotland and Wales, um, but also quite a few other places throughout that area as well. So who are the Celtic Fae to you and what do you already know? I know nothing. Awesome. <laughs> this is <completely laughs> right on. brand new for me. This is really excited. Wonderful. Welcome. <laughs> Um, is that EJ? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, um, so awesome. You made it just in time. We just started class and my very first question to everybody was, um, what are the Celtic Fae and what do you already know about them? Or what do you, um, what are already some of your assumptions about them or things that you've already heard or learned? Are you like asking me specifically or like the group? Well, I was asking the group, but Katrina already answered. So I guess I'm asking you. Oh. <laughs> Katrina said she knows nothing. So. Oh. Yes. I was just going to kind of sum it up. I was like, I don't like using the word, but I guess it kind of fits like fairies, pixies, nature spirits. Yes, definitely. Totally. I think that nature spirits is actually a beautiful term for Celtic Fae, especially. Um, and the Celtic Fae are very special. The Celtic Fae are where a lot of this idea that we have of all Fae stem from. So we really like to do this, especially in the United States, um, at least I'm from the United States, so I can speak to that. But in the U.S., from what I've noticed, we really like to kind of group pagan mythology together and pretend that it covers all of the cultures of the world. So we like to say um, things like the Fae do this without realizing that there are, you know, 5,000 different spiritualities surrounding completely different Fae from all over the world, as well as nature spirits and creatures that go by completely different names, such as the Jinn and the Aziza, Aziza from Africa and the Jinn from the Middle East who are going to have completely different mythology. But the mythology that we tend to think is what all Fae are, tend to stem from the mythology of Celtic Fae. And I was telling Katrina when the class started that this is a book that I suggest for beginners. If you are just, just starting out, you don't know anything really yet, and you just kind of want to take your very first dive into Celtic Fae mythology, Teresa Mori is a beautiful author. This book is called Fairies and Nature Spirits by Teresa Mori, and um, she is amazing with Celtic mythology. She comes from Ireland, and she discusses just a lot of her experience with the Fae, as well as a lot of the mythology that she learned growing up, and things like that, and I, I really love this book. So um, I also talked about how on the study guide, you can click on Fae Magic and click on Celtic Fae Mythology, and there's already a really large section for it on the website. So today we are going to start with um, one of the... Uh -huh. One of the really cool stories of the Fae, and a lot of people don't realize that the Fae as a whole, Fae is an umbrella term for many different creatures and spirits that exist throughout um, a lot of Celtic practices. And one of my favorites that we are going to talk about, we are going to talk about different encounters with the Fae different types of Fae that people have encountered and the stories that they tell after their encounters with the Fae. <laughs> and so the very first one 
is that people um, obviously assumed that the, <clears throat> I'm just going to read it instead of trying to summarize it because my words will get all jumbled if I try to summarize it. But anyway, that they are merely a product of the imagination in the most frivolous sense, being at best a diversion and at worst a dangerous delusion for minds that can't or won't cope with reality. In this category, we might include accounts of the fairies are quite consciously made up in order to get attention or that fairies are have been considered a mental health issue, that a form of hallucination, a form of a personality disorder, um, a form of schizophrenia, things like that, um, or being inebriated. A lot of people talk about how the people who have seen the fairies, um, people will ask them, you know, if they were taking drugs, you know, if they were on mushrooms, if they were drinking and things like that. And a lot of times the answer is yes. I personally do not believe that. I very much so believe in the Fae. Um, but of course, that is one of the very first things that you hear when you talk to people who don't necessarily believe in the Fae is that a lot of the encounters were from people who might have already had mental health problems or who were drinking or inebriated or something like that. Um, but then there's also a lot of history behind that as well, that maybe a lot of cultures believed that taking herbal hallucin hallucinatory drugs and hallucinogenics can bring you closer to different realms. That it's not that you saw a hallucination, it's that taking mushrooms brings you closer to the veil of different dimensions and different worlds, which can help you to be able to see what was already there. Um, <clears throat> then, um, there's also the idea and part of mythology that they are in fact the souls of the dead, that they are ghosts or entities that exist in the other realm, but not necessarily in the realm of a different creature, but just in the realm of humans or animals or any sentient being that has passed on and died and that their spirits would be considered the fae. And that is another form of mythology that people will say is that it's just their spirits. Um, so, Many tales recount people taken bodily form into fairyland, who thus became ghosts, riding with the fairies and passing into the hollow hills with the fairy host. These studies of Evan Wentz indicated that in Celtic areas, the domain of the dead was very often equated with fairies. The other simpler view is that the accounts of fairies are just encounters with those who have departed this life but have not moved on to other realms, remaining instead earthbound. This takes us into the question of what exactly is a ghost and what is a spirit? So there are two sides to the ghost mythology that like fairies might be ghosts. Is that one, um, obviously a very, very long time ago, um, children, like the very sad fact of the matter is a very, very long time ago before medical technology, before <clears throat> a lot of the different things that we have now to help keep human beings alive. Um, children had, there, there were a lot of children that died and there became a huge mythology surrounding your, you know, your child gets lost in the forest and that she was taken away by the Fae. Um, or they were taken away by the Fae, he or she, or, you know, they were taken away by the Fae, and that kind of translated into, well, they died, but they became a fairy. 
And so the idea was that it was either children who had passed on or the Fae had just taken their soul or that the child had gotten lost and the Fae was trying to help the child get home and took them to the realm of the fairies when they couldn't find their way back home. Um, but in a sense, all of them kind of led to this idea that the child had left the earthly realm. And whether you want to call that death or you just want to call it transformation, they had left this realm and entered a different realm. And now they were part of the world of the Fae. And so that is a, another idea that people had and another form of mythology that surrounds Celtic Fae. There's also this idea that um, they are here to watch over us. There is like the, it's kind of called the guardian angel theory, but that, you know, way before, um, obviously this mythology existed long before any Judeo-Christian religion. And so that they were kind of this very first sense of a guardian angel of a spirit or entity or um, almost demigod of some sort that watched over you and that helped humans, whether that means that they gave us the, um, the thoughts and ideas of how to use, like there are some mythology that say that they gave us the idea of how to use tools, how to make fire, that they are elemental beings that gave humans the knowledge of how to tend to the earth and how to farm and how to um, sanitize water and how to exist on the planet um, and that they are watching over us and helping us. There's also, of course, the opposite to that, that they are an evil entity that is here to harm us, that is here to take your soul. Um, there's all kinds of mythology surrounding this idea that they are there to steal your name, that they are there to um, steal bits and pieces of who you are, um, that they create, that they are tricksters, that they create riddles and ways to kind of trap you in a different dimension, in a different realm, or they create ways to get you lost in the woods so that they are able to take you to a different realm, or a lot of these ideas and mythology surrounding the idea that they might be slightly more trickster or even some go as far as that they are evil and um, that they are out there specifically to hurt humans, that they don't like humans. There's a lot of mythology surrounding that. Obviously, especially those two, the guardian angel theory, as well as the like trickster evil theory, we are going to get dive way deeper into those and talk about why those mythologies exist, where they came from and what they are and um, what spiritualities, what rituals, what um, spells and witchcraft was done in the name of that type of fairy worship and that type of fairy belief and practice. Um, but right now we're kind of just going over what the different encounters are, what the different beliefs are and kind of just skimming the top. Um, they also have the different idea that they are neither like almighty good or almighty bad. They are neither angelic or evil, um, but something in between. Then that um, this idea kind of stems from that they were caught on this earth's plane. So they're not really supposed to be here. They kind of get trapped in this dimension and find it hard to leave and how to figure out their way out. It, and um, so they are best to be avoided because they're kind of mad that they got stuck in this dimension. They are kind of a dimensional being that isn't supposed to be here. Not good or bad, just mad about the fact that they are here. Um, they are beings inhabiting parallel dimensions. Um, that they appear from time to time when interdimensional warp occurs. So a lot of these mythologies surround this idea that our dimension is just one of millions that exists and sometimes they cross, cross paths. 
and sometimes they warp into each other. And sometimes the dimensional, interdimensional stuff gets messy. And so what happens is when our dimension and another dimension kind of end up getting messy and intertwined, that that's when you see the fae. So you always know that um, our universe got messy with another parallel universe, whatever you think that means, whether they crashed into each other or whether there was kind of a time lapse or whether there was kind of a um, interdimensional phenomenon of some sort, that's when you see the Fae. And it's when different dimensions kind of collide. And so that's kind of a good way to know that that happened is if you see the Fae. Um, they are beings from other planets. That was a big one. And a lot of people don't talk about that one, especially when we talk about mythology, when we talk about, you know, these ideas that people had a very, 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 very long time ago. We are talking about, you know, some of this mythology goes back 3000 years and this mythology about the Fae, we have always thought that now, of course, we probably didn't call them planets because we had none of that technology and we had none of, none of those words. Um, but looking up at the sky, especially before light pollution, the sky was incredible before light pollution. It still is. If you go up to the mountains and you like look up, it's, it's amazing. But before light pollution, that must have looked like an essence of God. Like that must have just looked like magic in itself and like this gorgeous, beautiful, unknown world that existed up there. And um, so a lot of mythology is based on entities existing up in the sky because it, we didn't know what those beautiful lights were shining from the sky and what all the big, beautiful colors were. <clears throat> and, you know, if you go to the mountains now and you look up and you can kind of see the Milky Way and you can see all of the beautiful stars that exist up there, it is you know, that even comes to my mind, even though I, I mean, I don't understand the science, but I know that the science exists that tells me what all of those things are and we know, but it still looks like magic. <laughs> and so I can definitely see, you know, 2000 years ago, people looking up and thinking that those were fairies. And so there are so many different stories about the Fae, especially, um, well, not especially. All different cultures have ideas of them coming from space, but the Celtic Fae have really cool stories of the basically fairies coming from space, fairies coming from UFOs, fairies being UFOs, so that the unidentified flying object was a Fae, um, or that they are, they don't live in a different dimension, they live on a different planet, or they live on a star. Um, there are so many really, like, there's so much mythology based around fairies being in space, which I think is so cool. <laughs> and of course, too, like, because the fae have always been seen as creatures that don't need oxygen, that don't need, you know, they're not carbon-based life forms. They are not life forms that would need the same things to survive as we do, especially the Celtic fae. When you go to something like the jinn, the jinn do need earthly things to be able to survive, um, but the fae do not. And so it would make sense. They could live somewhere like Jupiter or Saturn because they don't need the same things that we need and they are not killed by the same things that we are killed by. And therefore it's kind of a cool idea to think that the fae existed on different planets and that's a theory that has existed for thousands of years. Um, of course, then there's the idea that they are nature spirits, um, that they look after the plants and the trees and the natural world in general, so that they are here to protect the earth, that they are here to pro protect the water, that they are here to protect the forest. And then, of course, that if you damage the forest, if you do something super harmful to the water or to um, the trees or to the plants, that you will get harmed by the fae. Um, that they are elementals is another one too, which sounds very similar, but it's not quite the same. Um, elementals are more of the outbreath 
of natural energies. So they are like the living embodiment of states of matter. So it's not like they protect the trees, they are the trees. They don't protect the water, they are the water. Um, they are pagan gods. That is another one too, as well, that they are pagan gods and goddesses. They are heroes and heroines. There's all kinds of mythology surrounding the Fae being warriors, um, being very similar stories that you would get from like the Greek gods and goddesses, um, the Celtic gods and goddesses, the you know Norse gods and goddesses, that the Fae are closer to that, that they are closer to something like Bridget, something like Frigg or Freya or something like um, Zeus and things like that, that they are just gods and goddesses with their own background and their own world and their own dimension and their own um, hierarchy as well. They also have the, um, the court of the Fae that is a huge part of mythology that people think that they have um, an entire hierarchy that they exist by. Um, or that they were real. And this is something that you get from a lot of the stories of Celtic pygmy fairies, that they did exist, that they, there was a time when these beings were creatures that walked the earth um, and that they were physical, actual beings much like humans, much like animals, um, but that they went extinct and that there are very, very few of them left, but they hide. And that, you know, there's a lot of stories based on how they live, like they literally live, like they are actual beings that you could feel and touch and kill and harm and hurt. And that they exist in the mounds on the beach that they exist inside little homes in the forest, that you can create little fairy homes for them outside, that it's not just that an entity is going to enter the home, but that a real little tiny creature is going to enter the home that is a fae. And that the only reason we can't see them is not because they are invisible or because they can swap dimensions or go across and through the veil but because they're hiding and they're just very good at hiding um that they live in extremely remote areas this would be very similar to the idea of the yeti or bigfoot or the loch ness monster that like they exist they super exist they are real you can kill them you can hurt them you can love them you can be with them you can keep them as pets <laughs> there's a lot of stories about people keeping fairies as pets or like little kids going out to go play games and play hide and seek with the fairies and go hang out with the fairies and draw the fairies but like they are real and that it's just that nobody's gotten a picture um and then of course there's ones that they are animals um but that they're like extremely sentient animals so they're like shapeshifters so this idea that like the, they are real, like physical, actual beings, not interdimensional beings, but the only reason that we haven't really truly seen them is because they're shapeshifters and they can shapeshift into animals and plants and things like that. Um, so these are a lot of the different possibilities and some of the biggest, most famous folklore and mythology surrounding Celtic Fae. Um, now that I have read all of those, I want to hear your thoughts. After I have read those, number one, did you already know about some of those? And which ones do you like? Which ones do you think um, sound more realistic to you specifically? Which mythology is your favorite? Like, I want to hear some comments. <laughs> if you want, obviously, of course. Does anybody have any comments or questions?
Okay, that's fine. Maybe we'll have some more things to comment on as we go on. So the first thing I wanted everybody to do is we are going to read down um, to where it says there, I'm gonna highlight where to stop. Um, and I'm going to scroll up. Feel free to go to this page if you're on a laptop and kind of follow along and read it yourself, but I'm gonna slowly go down. So kind of give me the thumbs up emoji when you are done reading this section and then I'll go on. I have to pee really bad though. I'm so sorry. So read this introduction section and I'll be back in like one quick second. I am so sorry about that. I am back. Let's see. Oh no, I'm so sorry. The Zoom app. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, are you able to read this section? If not, what I would suggest is just type in the website on your phone and kind of read it on your own instead of trying to like read through the Zoom screen. That would probably be a lot easier for you, EJ. And I'm so sorry that's happening. That's annoying. Okay, I'm going to... Scroll down a little bit for you guys. Um, okay, no problem. I'll see you back really soon. Welcome back. Okay. Wait. That was so cool. All right. Yay! <laughs> I hope it works better now and you're able to read all of this. Um, I've kept it in the same place just so you can make sure you know where we are and you can catch up.
And I just love, I love hearing this author talk about, it's obviously she's focusing very much on Irish mythology and the Celts aren't necessarily only Irish, um, but you can tell she grew up with the mythology, that this is the stories that she grew up with and she explains them so beautifully and so well. I really enjoy it. <laughs> and um, A Book of Fairies by Katherine Briggs is actually also a really good one as well. She mentions that in her book. Um, and uh, Katherine Briggs, Catherine Briggs, oh my god, Catherine Briggs really likes to talk about Scottish and Scotland, Scottish uh, mythology surrounding the Fae, which is also really cool. Um, and Celtic Fae just have such a beautiful mythology. Scroll down just a little bit. What's kind of interesting too is, of course, during the colonization of um, a lot of Celtic societies and the religious colonization of Celtic practices, Celtic pagan practices, um, when a lot of Judeo Christian religions took over and it, it kind of decimated a lot of the pagan spirituality. A lot of it was lost, um, but the traditions and mythology of the Fae, the idea of the Fae, it didn't leave, it didn't get lost. And it people really kept their knowledge and their belief and their traditions surrounding the Fae. And, um, Obviously, a lot of the other traditions they couldn't keep or else they would be killed by the Catholic Church or the Christian Church or by a lot of the, yeah, the Judeo-Christian religions that existed at the time. But for some strange reason, the Fae and fairy culture and fairy tradition stayed. I've done some research on why that is, and there are a lot of different theories for why it is. And of course, one of the theories is, is that the Fae made it so. And that the fae made it that way um but also you know a lot of the theories are that um a lot of colonizers were actually scared of these ideas of the fae um that also their traditions because you see the mythology of the fae all over europe that they didn't want to mess with the fae because even though they had been kind of brainwashed by this new religion and um, that colonialism sucks and is really evil and did some horrible, terrible things, they were still scared of the Fae. And they didn't want to harm a lot of the traditions surrounding the Fae in fear of what the Fae would do, which is also a very interesting idea. But there are lots of ideas surrounding why Fae tradition never really seemed to die off um, and people didn't seem to be murdered for it as much as they were for a lot of their other indigenous traditions.
and I'll kind of scroll a little bit past where I told you to stop. I kind of told you to stop right here, but feel free to read um, that next paragraph because it goes in to where we are about to go next. It's a very good transitionary paragraph into what we are about to talk about next. And in this class and in this course, because um, we are going to start doing this exact same class every week, um, like not this exact same class, we are going to have a Celtic Fae magic class every week. And what I really start, I want to start doing is doing a lot of rituals and witchcraft and traditions surrounding the Celtic Fae. And um, including things that are a little bit more modern, such as creating modern fairy gardens together and doing um, some modern fairy witchcraft, but as well as following some very ancient traditions and doing some really ancient rituals that involve calling upon the Fae and interacting with the Fae. And I'm so excited and I can't wait to do all of that with you guys. So. Give me a thumbs up if you're finished reading. There's a little emoji. You can just click the emoji. If you don't, you can also just turn on your mic and say done. But you can also give me, yeah. Thanks for the thumbs up emoji. Awesome. All right. So. The next thing that we are going to do, I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a second and go here. We're gonna watch a really short video that kind of, I don't know. I've been watching, ugh, number one, something that I have noticed that makes me really upset too is that I looked, I looked and I looked and I searched and I searched for a video that actually accurately displays the traditions and cultures surrounding Celtic Fae and the real, like anthropological research that we've done on pagan practices surrounding the Fae. And they, there aren't many at all. Some of them are just so like, they're so very Disney. They're so very like, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe them, but like they're very modern day cartoony and very like, you know, sprinkle fairy dust everywhere and sprinkle it with intention and get your wishes answered. And I just want to tell you that that, that, that is not, <clears throat> that is not ancient Celtic fey practice. <laughs> but I found one and I'm so excited about it. That's actually really good. So hold on. Here we go. What's this? Is this the and one? it goes, white shields they carry in their hands with emblems of yep. pale silver. Okay. Stop. Pause. Okay. Share screens. Okay. So this one was super cool. I loved watching this one. Here we go. Meet Suvi, the magical all-in-one countertop kitchen robot. Suvi saves you time. What are the Irish fairies or the thing that she there are a few spiritual beings that loom larger in Irish folklore and tradition than fairies, or the Thénachine. They go by many names, including the good folk. Can everybody hear it? Are we all good? Thumbs up. Cool. Cool. The 
Dean of Maha, the little people, as I grew up hearing, the Dean of Beaga, and the Sluag Shia, the army of the Shi. They were associated with old places from the mounds of the Neolithic to the Iron Age. They could reside beneath the earth within trees, streams, and fields. They could be anywhere, unseen, saved by those who had the sight. But what were they, or should I say, what are they? Firstly, let's address what the fairy folk are not. They are not the gods of the gales. The gods were reduced to their level by ancient storytellers, but it is quite clear that the fairy folk are in fact a lower level of spiritual entity, one identical to many others known in Indo-European religions across Europe and beyond. You know, this is why they are commonly referred to in English as fairies, for instance. But we could also probably add in elves or even dwarves into this mix. They all seem to exist within the same sort of sphere. Medieval people understood them within a Christian context to have been fallen angels that existed on three separate levels in the air, within the land and waters, and beneath the earth, dwelling with the devil. This corresponds roughly to the tripartite uh, spatial division of the Indo-European worldview. So there are various types of these entities dwelling throughout the totality of the world, but their power and composition are thought to be largely similar. To understand them further, we should understand what a she is, if they are the people of it. Now the old Irish word she is the name given to the various mounds from ancient times where it was believed, and rightly so in many cases, that the dead were buried. This word in turn comes from Indo-European shiste, meaning to sit, to rest the origin for Irish sui and English sit. It would seem then that the mounds were named this because they were the seats of kings, or perhaps, and probably more correctly, they were called this because that is where the ancient people were put to rest, or sat and rested in death. Thus the she, or the sheed in old Irish pronunciation, means something like the resting place with a possible connotation of graveyard. Sheed can also mean peace in Old Irish, thus demonstrating again this connotation here that these beings are of places where people are at peace, meaning exactly the same as we mean in English when we say that, likely a euphemism for death. And indeed, it was considered very unlucky to call the fairies by name which is why they were called things like fair folk, good people. You know, these are euphemistic names. She can also refer to a type of wind, a gust of air or sudden blast, which would otherwise be called something like guitha. Recall that many of these mounds also had entranceways, passages inside them, like New Grange, for instance. If one stands before the entrance of such a passage or cave, because of the temperature differential, one can feel often a breeze upon them that was likely thought to emanate from within the cave or the passageway from the underworld. There are various references to the Danishi linked to the wind, it, even with tornadoes and dust devils being referred to as fairy gusts. The reason they are so associated with wind has to do with their spiritual, or one might say ghostly, nature. In Indo-European thought, the wind and air was closely tied to, if not identical to, the spirit, such that the human force of life, or what was thought of as part of the soul, was viewed as wind in all Indo-European beliefs. Latin, for instance, uses the word animus for soul, and this word refers to breath or wind from Proto-Indo-European hanha, meaning breath which gives rise to Greek animos, meaning wind or breeze, and Old Irish anim, meaning soul or life. And in modern Irish, uh, this is used to mean name. Now this meaning is directly equivalent uh, to the Tokarian B, where uh, anma 
means soul or self. So thus, the, the very core of the human being, its spiritual essence, was wind or breath. So the nature of the fairies is also akin to that of breath. They are beings of air or spirit, and thus they move through the air and can likewise control the air. When a person died, it was thought that their spirit was also moved through the air, being air itself. This is also akin to later myths of people being abducted by fairies, disappearing into their world, never to be seen again. And where have they gone? And what is their world? It is the world of the dead, the world of the spirit detached from physical form, a type of shadow world that mirrors our own, which is quite how the fairy world is described in various sources. They are perhaps most akin to ghosts, but with the caveat that they are not generally considered to be spirits of the dead, but are spiritual beings in origin. They are a type of minor level deity, you could say. But as the fair folk are not high gods of the celestial realm, uh, they do not exist within that heavenly realm, and they play a sort of intermediary role. And the fairy host, the Sloikshia, were said to be led on various occasions by none other than Lu Glawada. When we realize the spiritual nature of these entities, and that the Sloikshia were strongly connected to winds, it is possible that this is referring to a similar phenomena as the wild hunt in continental sources. It may well be that the fairy host here is thought of as the storm winds, whereas the spear of Lu is a lightning blast. There is a great description of this host given in an old Irish poem dedicated to them, and it goes, White shields they carry in their hands, with emblems of pale silver, with glittering blue swords, with mighty stout horns, in well-devised battle array, ahead of their fair chieftain. They march amid blue spears, pale-visaged, curly-headed bands. They scatter the battalions of the foe. They ravage every land they attack. Splendidly they march to combat, a swift, distinguished, avenging host. No wonder, though their strength be great, sons of queens and kings are one and all. On their heads are beautiful golden yellow manes with smooth, comely bodies, with bright blue starred eyes, with pure crystal teeth and thin red lips. Good they are at manslaying, melodious in the alehouse, masterly at making songs, skilled at playing fithel. And as you can see from that description, they in fact are very similar to the sort of personality or character that comes through about Lou himself. So the fair folk can bring luck and they can also bring disease and death. In various stories, they escort people into the underworld. And so they may play a role in bringing souls of the dead after death, carrying them away on the wind, perhaps. However, they were also thought to seek people's deaths on occasion, hitting them with fairy spears or arrows to cause them maladies and death, where they would claim them in the fairy world when they die. Joint inflammation and many other illnesses were ascribed to them. Even leprosy was said to be caused by them. The actions of these fairy darts is similar to the power ascribed early on in Greek myth to the arrows of Apollo. Sometimes it was thought that certain stones, especially quartz, and also Stone Age arrows or axe heads were actually fairy darts. And these were kept by people who were known as fairy doctors who would chant while performing rituals with these objects, waving them over the person thought to be afflicted by a fairy dart in order to heal them. And others were kept buried under people's homes sometimes or buried under their barns. Traditionally, offerings were made to the fairies of biscuits, bread, cakes, milk, and other small offerings. It was thought that they were especially protective 
of ancient sacred sites, and to disturb these places would be to bring ruin upon the ones who did. When in the early 19th century, archaeological discoveries were made of masses of gold, people considered it to be fairy gold and warned of danger to anyone associated with it. Even more recently, these concerns were expressed at various times with road construction projects that cut into or near ancient sites. Now, there are many different types of Ashi or Dina Shi, and each one should really have its own video. There's too much to get into in one. But this is meant to give an overview of sort of what they are in origin. And they are spirit beings akin to air or wind. But there are three major types, as mentioned fairies of the air, which manifest as gusts of wind and even storm winds, and are presented as warriors in a great cavalcade of horsemen. There are those of the land and waters which reside in localized places such as trees or ancient sites and mounds, streams and lakes. And there are those who dwell in the dark and the deep places. The fairies of the air and land were thought to be beautiful and marvelous to create sweet music if only they were appeased by humans or left alone in their sights undisturbed they would be peaceful or, or would even help people at some times but those of the dark were thought to be willfully evil and were equated with christian demons so i'd like to give a big thanks to my patreon subscribers if you'd like to help out this channel i recommend that you head over there so <clears throat> That was such a cool overview of um, specifically Irish faith um, and their name being the she, um, which the she are, it's pronounced she, but um, it is spelled S-I-D-H-E. So if you ever, if you are reading a book, um, including this book and including a lot of Celtic fey magic books, and you see the word that is spelled S I D H E, it is pronounced she, and that is what he was talking about. Um, <clears throat> so we are going to talk about some different entities of she, as he was talking about um, different types of Irish fey. Um, fey is an umbrella term, just as he was discussing. Fey is an umbrella term that captures tons, basically all of European creatures that are not quite gods. Some, in, like I said, in some mythology they are gods, and I kind of didn't like in that video how he just kind of dismissed the idea that they were, um, because there's definitely a lot of mythology surrounding not Irish necessarily, but a lot of Celtic. So um, when you look at Scottish mythology, that does represent them much, much closer to creation deities. Um, but a lot of Irish mythology is going to kind of put them in the middle. They're not human. They are not quite deities. Um, I guess they would kind of fall under the idea of demigod, but that's still kind of a completely different idea. So they're just, they're in the middle. And, um, <clears throat> but there are many, many, many different kinds. And one of the kinds that we are going to talk about today are um, the Banshee. So how many of you are, you know, have you two <laughs> heard about um, Banshees? Yes. And like other like subversions like shrieks, and the uh, I don't remember what it's called, but like it's essentially like uh, someone was promised her hand in marriage, she was ended up murdered or something, but there's something still binding her to this plane kind of thing. They're supposed to be related, but yeah, yes, awesome, exactly. So that's awesome. Yes, so one of the famous banshees, which there are many different banshees, but one of the most famous are Lady Fanshawe, um, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing Fanshawe correctly, but 
that is it is lady fanshaw and um the banshee <clears throat> so the banshee is an eerie figure from irish lore her hair is long and cloak is green and her eyes are vivid red from endless weeping um just like EJ said, there's big mythology surround. When I say weeping, it is um, much closer to, to screeching. Um, and more properly pronounced, bean she, which just like we watched in that video, if you're starting to get um, why the end of her name is she, is because she is a fae. And so it would, a lot of times the spelling of Banshee is B-A-N-S-H-E-E. -E. But traditionally, the end of her name, it would have been um, Bean, so B-E-A-N, and then S-I-D-H-E for Faye, or for She. Um, so she is a type of Faye. Um, but the She are Irish fairies. <clears throat> Um, who some say predate Celtic people in general. Like I said, the idea of the Fae are very, 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 very old. Um, um, da, da, da. Okay, so the Banshee are also called the Tuatha de Danon, people of the goddess Dana, a powerful and enchanted race who inhabited Erie before the Malaysians landed, who were subs, who, subs, what, I can talk, subsent, sub, <clears throat> who struggled with, seduced and inspired their Celtic heirs. On winter nights, when the wind kneed along the hilltop where we lived, I would block my ears against the wail of the banshee that my Irish father told me could be heard crying when a family member was about to die. So, um, this happens in Colorado too, but I'm sure it is much stronger in Ireland because these stories are so deep in Irish culture. But if you've ever witnessed a windstorm, when the wind howls so loudly that it does, it sounds like a bellow coming from a person or from an animal, um, it was said that those were the screams and shrieks of the banshee and that you would hear them right before or the bean she however you want to pronounce it but you would hear those shrieks before someone died which when you think about it must have been pretty crazy because i'm sure windstorms happen all the time in ireland <laughs> and so somebody was going to die quite frequently um but <clears throat> on hearing of the death of my uncle, my father said sadly, it was the banshee I heard that night. The banshee is still heard by certain Irish families, including some who have immigrated to the United States and elsewhere, for the land of the Fae is a little bit closer to those with Celtic heritage, wherever they may be. So when they say that, um, a lot, that's, that's a big thing in Celtic culture now. The Fae, when they talk about the Fae, the specific Fae they are talking about is that if you have Celtic origin, if you are Celtic, um, if you are, you know, Scottish or Irish or um, Welsh or um, even predating a lot of the names that we have for different places within the UK, um, as well as other, there's a lot of, the borders got redrawn. So when you talk about Celtic culture, it spreads vastly throughout the area um, up there. And it would not be obviously like Ireland, what we call Ireland now, a very, very long time ago, those borders, you know, were redrawn. And so if you have heritage from that area in general, um, it is said that these specific fit, the she, that you are more likely to see them, that they have a connection with Celtic people. Um, so yes, here we go. 
So I wanted to talk about the experience of Lady Fenshaw. So the experience of Lady Fenshaw is recounted by Catherine Briggs. Um, Lady Fanshawe lived between 1625 and 1676, and her encounter was extremely vivid, the way that she describes it. Occurring when she was visiting uh, Lady Honor O'Brien, she, she was woken in the small hours by a strange sound. Drawing back the curtain, she saw in the moonlight a woman with red hair and a face of ghastly pallid leaning in through the window. After saying, a horse three times the woman vanished as if her body were vapor. Lady Fanshawe's hair stood on end and she woke her husband. There was no more sleep that night for Lady Fanshawe or her husband. As morning dawned, Lady O'Brien came, came to them to say that she had been up all night tending to a dying kingsman who had passed away at two in the morning. She expressed the hope that there had been no disturbance because she was, because it was custom that when a family member was on her deathbed, the shape of a woman appeared each night at the window until the person was dead. This person appearing at the window every night would have been called a banshee. Many years in the past, this woman, um, <clears throat> yeah. many years in the past, this woman had been seduced by a member of the O'Brien family who on finding her pregnant murdered her and threw her into the, into the river beneath the window. Not surprisingly, Lady Fanshawe and her husband made a hasty departure, being of the opinion that Irish superstition made them a prey to the wiles of the devil. So basically the story is that this specific banshee, so there was a very specific banshee that haunted the O'Brien family. And it is said that it was a fae. Um, and like I said, there are a lot of fae stories and fae mythology that really they are just the dead. They are just spirits that are trapped here. And so um, that this woman was um, assaulted and tortured and many horrible things happened to her due to the O'Brien family and that she was then murdered and thrown in the river by the house and her spirit became a banshee and every single time any member of the O'Brien family or any member of kind of the royal guard or the people who work very closely with the O'Brien family um if they were going to um, if they were just like perfectly healthy people, suddenly they would start seeing a woman appear at the window with red hair um, and green robes and um, they would die. And it was the banshee killing them to get revenge for what happened to her. And you could also hear her screaming, which was the really big bellows of wind. Um, so then some people said that this was just a simple haunting glamorized by tales of the banshee and this was just a ghost a regular ghost and had nothing to do with the faith or <clears throat> do the people of the she give such mournful tasks to earthbound spirits of the dead so another theory is that um the fey basically i don't know what you if you want to call it but that more of her spirit was taken over by a fae. And that is called a banshee, is when a very traumatized soul gets taken over by the fae or even protected by the fae. And then it would be called a banshee. Um, or perhaps this was just a banshee herself, mistaken for the dead girl that it had nothing to do with the dead girl. They just happened to do something horrible, torture a woman, they felt guilty for it, but really all that was happening was that they were seeing a banshee and then they thought that it was the girl that they had thrown into the river and killed because they were so guilty about it, or they felt so guilty about it. Some accounts of banshees describe them as being the manifestations of a young girl who, um, a young girl of the family who died 
and often the banshee is a woman who died in childbirth. Um, the story and account that Lady Fenshaw said and wrote down and discussed and talked about, um, she had said that she had heard the word horse over and over again. Um, the reason that is interesting is for the horse has long been considered capable of riding between worlds. So um, that is why a lot of times you will see banshees as well as fae riding horses in this mythology is because the horse can transfer between dimensions. Um, perhaps Lady Fenshaw was mistaken and the word that she heard was hearse. Um, or this was just a bad dream and nothing happened at all. <laughs> um, so this is one of, usually when you hear about banshees, there's uh, a lot of stories written down about the banshee and about just, there's a lot that I've heard very similar to what EJ described, where um, it is a woman in mourning um, or a woman who was, supposed to marry someone and then something really tragic happened whatever that might be or a woman who died in childbirth and or a woman whose child died so usually the story of a banshee is um, a woman and usually it is the story of a living woman that did exist at one point and then either died or just well usually they did die and but died feeling really sad, whether it be because like her husband had gotten killed right before they got married, their child had died or something like that, or they were tortured and killed in a really horrible way. And then it's kind of a lot like a haunting, but instead of becoming a ghost, you become a she, which is the fae. So these are really interesting encounters, but Lady Fenshaw is one of the very first encounters that was, she was not part of this tradition. She was visiting an Irish family. She was not Irish herself. She was visiting an Irish family. She didn't know any of these stories. She didn't know who the Banshee were. She didn't know who the Fae were. She, I mean, I'm sure she knew who the Fae were, but not the Irish Fae. She was not Irish. So she was not accustomed to these specific mythologies. So for her to say that she saw and heard these exact things, that were specifically based off of a specific mythology that existed at that time without knowing that that mythology even existed, kind of became this affirmation for people that, that there was a banshee haunting the O'Briens, that there was a banshee that existed on the property because this woman who went there had never heard the stories and saw the woman anyway and saw the banshee anyway even though she had never heard the story so she would have no reason to fake it or to pretend out of cultural bias so it's a very interesting story um but banshee's one of the biggest things that i wanted to bring up is anytime that you usually hear the name of a fae such as banshee end in the word she it is usually an irish um or stems from Irish mythology. And that is why I wanted to talk about the Banshee is because anytime you hear, yeah, anytime you hear it end with she, it stems from the she of Ireland. Um, and then, oh, right. <clears throat> and then, <laughs> So number one, does anybody have any comments about the Banshee? I thought that was a cool story. Um, I always like sharing stories where it really does seem like there might have been something that went on because how did she know about those exact words and encounters if she had no idea about the mythology? So I always think that that's very interesting. I, uh, Remember the name of the other specter? I'll just label it as <clears throat> like night wraiths and noon wraiths, or like similar, but mm -hmm. their their cause of death was more more brutal typically. Um, and I believe that story is more so of horse, not hearse. Umbra is an equine phantom, which is a dead horse that usually accompanies like a plague maiden or 
like a, a full blown banshee instead of just like a typical wraith. You know what I mean? So yeah, no, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I definitely think it sounds more like she heard um, the word horse for many reasons that have to do with horses relating to fae and banshee mythology. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. I totally missed everything you just said. I got a phone call and it went so quiet. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> well, here we go. <coughs> this is not, hold on. How do I? No, no, I don't want to share. No, no. I want to. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So we already went through all of that, by the way. The reason I am skipping that is because I read that to you out loud. Or I summarized it for you out loud. Here we go. And then this is, by the way, it is on the website. If you ever want to go back and read the actual story, because I did do a little bit of summarizing there. The full story of Lady Fanshawe and the Banshee is on the website. And then we have the Jela Divata, or the Hal, the Hala Divata. Um, so if you would like to read that, 1992 um, is obviously much more recent than 1672. Um, It was also the year I was born. So go ahead and give me a thumbs up again once once you are finished reading this section and we'll go on. This is such a cool story. I kind of wanted you to get the whole thing rather than me just summarizing it. I love this story of this encounter. I love hearing about actual encounters from the Fae that were so interesting to people that they were passed down. Some of these stories, I mean, like I said, that one's been passed down since 1672. And they're just passed down and written in every single book because they're just so interesting. Um, once again, I'll be right back again. I don't know why I have to pee so much today. I don't know. Um, give me a thumbs up when you're done. I didn't see it. If you already gave it to me, I am sorry. Awesome. Oh, I made a typo. 
<clears throat> I know I typed this all out and it's supposed to be an elven creature who, not woo. So um, if everybody's not done, that's fine. I'll leave it up here on the screen. But so basically something that I wanted to bring up, obviously this is not a Celtic story, um, but is that elves, if we are talking about elves, gnomes, she, um, other existences of fae, they are all, they all fall under the umbrella term of fae when we are talking about Europe and South America and Central America. When you're talking about Europe, South America, and Central America, usually the term fey or even just translated into different languages, of course, they are not all going to use the word fey. It is going to translate into all the other languages across Europe, South America, and Central America. Um, but it's kind of an umbrella term. So, Elves are going to fall under this category as well, and so are a lot of other entities such, like I said, as the Banshee, as Sirens, as um, water spirits, as nature spirits in general, so anything that is considered an earth spirit, a water spirit, an air spirit, just like the guy was mentioning in the video, um, a lot of air spirits are she in Ireland, and um, so the same goes for a lot of places throughout Central South America, and um, Europe. Um, and even in Russia as well, they have a very umbrella term. Um, a lot of Slavic traditions and um, are going to have a very umbrella term when it comes to the word fey, but obviously translated into their language instead of calling them all different things. Now, if you go to Africa or the Middle East um, or a lot of East Asia, they start separating it and the umbrella term isn't as potent so like the jinn are just the, the jinn they are not an umbrella term for like 400 different things that vary as much as the difference between a siren and a banshee and a warrior she and an earth she and an air she it's not going to be the umbrella term like that the jinn are a very specific mythology that even though they vary from myth to myth are all very similar and are not going to be as different as something like a siren and a banshee. Um, and so, yeah, it's a very big umbrella term. They're not gonna be, you know, like elves and the fae are technically fall under the exact same umbrella and can be in a lot of cultures interchangeable as well. Um, and it's not the same in Africa, Asia and the Middle East. Um, yes, but this story I also thought was very interesting. It definitely happened. There is a record of it. You can look it up. It is so cool. Um, and it is that this little boy, he had drowned in a river. Um, and I mean, like 10 minutes is a long time. 10 minutes and, and you know, you, you are dead. <laughs> if you are under the water that long. Um, if you are completely submerged underwater for 10 minutes, unless you are like the world record, I don't even think the world record is 10 minutes, but I could be wrong. I don't really know how long the, the, the world record is, but he was a little kid and he was five. So he was definitely not the world champion of holding his breath. And so after being completely submerged underwater for 10 minutes, he should have been dead. And there are so many accounts of this story. It was 1992. So, you know, obviously we had books and I mean, by then the internet was already coming out. And so like there was, um, 
many ways to keep track of the fact that this happened and many ways right now that we have record of it and you can look it up. And this really happened. <clears throat> and the boy to this day, who um, would be five years older than me, says that this, you know, this was a real life experience for him. He was saved by a water spirit, that he was saved by a member of the Fae, which is such a cool story. Um, even though it's not Celtic, it doesn't quite fall under what we're learning today, but still such a cool story. I wouldn't necessarily say it's not quite Celtic. The the Jala Devada, I don't know where it or it's an origin from, but they're technically a nymph, which is associated with the water sprites, which are more Celtic. Um Technically, that yeah. is true. So, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess that would kind of fall under <laughs> Celtic, which is cool. See, thank you. Exactly. Um, <laughs> the a lot of times um, <clears throat> this story tends to be a story that you hear in more Slavic cultures. It tends to be a more just like general European story. So I don't necessarily associate it with only Celtic culture, but you're right. Thank you. Totally. And then, of course, as I was saying before, <laughs> you have the UFO entities um, that people have many accounts of, which are related. A lot of um, Celtic cultures relate that to the Fae. Um, you are going to see it different. Um, so, like, not all cultures are going to relate UFOs to the Fae. They have their own idea of what beings that come from space are. Um, if you look up, you know, the ancient Egyptians and what their ideas of what creatures that come from space are, it is really cool and not the Fae. Um, but in Celtic culture, a lot of the ideas that come from um, UFO entities um, are related to the Fae. And... This one as well is really cool. I don't know. Do you guys let me know. Do you feel like reading this one? This one's kind of a longer one. If you would like to, I can definitely hold it up there on the screen or we can totally move on. It is completely up to you guys. I just, the encounters are really cool to me, but.
I hate finding my typos. It should be on the grass, not oh the grass. I have to proofread these. Okay. <clears throat> and I think too, a lot of people don't realize how much of, especially in the United States, how much of what we just think of as fae folklore is not just, I mean, it is fae folklore, but it is specifically Celtic fae folklore. And I think that without realizing it, Celtic fae folklore has become some of the most popular, has become some of the most popular in the United States. We think of it and call it just fae folklore without realizing that there are millions of different mythologies surrounding, not and probably a million, I don't know, but there are thousands of different forms of fae folklore that exist all over the world, but um, the ones that traveled distinctly to the U.S. that a lot of people know about or have heard about but have no idea are Celtic um, are the very, very specific stories of Celtic folklore even our depictions of things like aliens and um, the way that we draw fairies and the way that we draw elves and the way that we perceive these creatures, we think of it as just a very general way of um, depicting these creatures, but really it's very Celtic. I think it's good for people to realize that and know that know the culture that you are taking from. It's perfectly fine. Celtic culture as a whole has become an extremely open practice. Obviously, like I said, they definitely have their idea that you can, um, being Celtic makes you very special when it comes to this, this type of folklore, but that everybody is welcome to enjoy and embrace and appreciate and participate in the culture. Um, but it's good to know the culture that you are taking from when you draw and idealize and, and think about the Fae and know that most of what you've heard in the United States is very Celtic. Usually from the people that I hear <clears throat> and the media that I see online. I always see it and I'm like, I wonder if you know that you're taking specifically from Celtic folklore. Okay, um, so that is the end of that one. Um, give me a thumbs up if you are all done and let me know if you have any comments about it. I think that story is so cool. And um, I think that all of these encounters are just so intriguing and so interesting. And 
I'm really excited that I got to share them with you. Um, no, what? No. Hang on. One second. No. Why didn't it show up in my history? What if you could turn on your Christmas lights? You can always separate. Um, we are going to watch another short video and then discuss it a little bit more deeply. This one is again, like I said, it's really hard to find videos that have very valid information about um, Celtic folklore and mythology surrounding the Fae because there's just so much out there that is invalid, but also just like, you know, we've thrown elves and fairies into everything. Half the videos you find are going to be about D&D &D and about Lord of the Rings and about so many things that just like same thing with Norse mythology. So many of its things are going to be about Marvel movies. So you have to kind of sift through that. Because that is not valid information. Oh my gosh, come on. Okay. We are. Maybe if I just. Thank you. So this one now we already talked. Oh my gosh. Stop. Skip it. It would be a great mistake. Okay. So we already discussed and talked about very briefly. Obviously, this is a very, very, very intro class. As you can tell, I am not going that deep. We are talking about encounters. We are talking about very, very brief introductions to what Celtic mythology thinks that the Fae might be as time has gone on, and watching very brief videos that just cover and skim the surface. I want to start off very slow, very small, and then we are going to dive into some super, super cool stuff um, when it comes to traditions surrounding the Fae. And I'm really excited, but I don't want to overwhelm you too quick. There's a lot of information. I have been studying this for a long time and there's a lot of information especially obviously it's really really hard to study every single fay i don't know everything there is to know i focused on a few of them and i have a very extensive knowledge on a few of them which has led me to seek out mentorship about celtic fay as a whole anyway now we are going to kind of skim the surface of scottish Fae and Scottish folklore surrounding the Fae. And this video is really cool. So. Indeed. To think that all the Fae, or she in Scotland, are dark, malevolent beasts. The vast majority of these fantastical creatures cannot be separated into good or evil. They are far more human than you might expect and their lives far more intricate than some would have you believe. Today we explore the legendary water spirit, the Urusk. The Urusk commonly appears as a half man, half goat creature. Similar to the satyr of Greek mythology, some have compared the general attitude of the Urusk with that of the Brownie, a Scottish house fairy that tends to be friendly and aid in chores. The Urusk, although looking nothing like the common Brownie, has a similar friendly attitude and a reputation for being a good humoured sloth. Where this comparison slips are in the preferred habitat of the she. This rough haired spirit comes from the thick forests of the Scottish Highlands and much prefers remote isolated lochs and rivers. It was commonly spotted during the evening, sitting atop a rock or hill, observing any intruders into its land. Some Urusk would talk with the travellers, others would act as guides, and others still 
which thrashed those that disturbed their isolation. But mostly, it did not meddle in the affairs of passers-by. However, this was not always the case. On some occasions, mostly during the winter, the Urus would come down from the hills and seek to warm itself in the houses of the villagers. To repay the kindness shown to it, the she would work hard all winter for the family, tending to animals, grinding grain and churning butter. It was thought that his presence in your home would bring good luck and prosperity. For this reason, many of the large highland estates would have a resident tourist. A seat close to the fire in the kitchen was always reserved for the sheep, and it would help with tasks around the grounds. Some Urusk would crave the companionship of humans, but due to their savage appearance, it was common that they caused fright to many passers-by. There are so many conflicting tales of the creature's attitude that some have suggested that there are multiple subspecies of Urusk. I think the answer is far simpler. Urusks are the result of the union between mortals and the she. The fairy lover, or Lenan she, is commonly thought to be a beautiful woman of the Doina she who would take a human lover. The offspring of this relationship was the Urusk, meaning that it was granted all the power and wisdom of the Doina she, but also all the confliction and individuality of mortals. All throughout Scottish history, there are many tales of encounters with these creatures. One well-known tale comes from the Reverend James McDougall, a collector of Scottish folklore. The Urus of Larachulan, in the land of Loch Aber, to the south of the great mountain Ben Nevis, lies the rocky valley of Larachulan. In this valley, there lived an Urus who delighted in jeering and calling to the shepherds that would pass through his land. Not a day would go by without the Urus hurling some nonsensical abuse to the poor shepherds. On one evening, a young shepherd was walking his cattle through the valley. This man was known to the Urus, as was his family. As soon as the cattle had passed the Urus's cave, the beast poked its head out and yelled, Carl, son of Carl, son of Carl, a Carl are you, and a Carl is your father, and a Carl your son will be, and his son will be a Carl. You will all be Carls, like it or not. The shepherd was used to the Urisk's odd behaviour, but still the strange call angered the young man. He had grown tired of this constant annoyance. Giving the creature no notice, the man, known to be a Carl, left the valley. Once he returned to the farmer, he had told him he had had enough of the she's nonsense, and there and then he quit. A few weeks later, the farmer hired a new shepherd to tend the cattle a man by the name of Donald Moore. Donald was a kind, honest man, always ready to work. On his first day herding the cattle through the valley, he heard a strange voice call out, Donald Moore, I don't like you. Having been well warned of the Urisk, Donald knew to pay no attention and continue on his way. The Urisk's cries occurred day after day. Every time Donald would walk through the valley, he would hear the calls of the strange creature. The new shepherd was beginning to lose his patience with the she. Time after time, he would be a victim to its cheering. He did not know how long he could contain his frustration. Then on one cold, wet night, Donald was returning home through the valley. The poor man was soaked through, bitterly cold, tired and hungry. As he passed the Urisk's cave, he heard the call. Donald Moore, I don't like you. Finally snapping, Donald swiveled in his heel, and with a cry far louder than the creature's, he screamed, That is for the return you owe me. Silence fell in the valley of Lerahulan. Donald turned and continued his journey homewards, his mind racing, not knowing if this encounter would only spur the beast on. The next morning, Donald reluctantly led the herd through the valley. The whole time the man was an edge, but nothing happened. The shepherd and the herd passed by the cave and out of the valley into the fields without hearing a sound from the Urus. In fact, it was said that no one would ever hear the sound of the Urus of Larachulan again. It is not known what the name of the sheep. Some suggested that he moved elsewhere as he was now terrified of Donald Moore. Another tale of the Urus would come from Glenmalley, not too far from Larachulan. 
this ghost would frequently come down from the hills and bother a young maid. On a near daily basis, the creature would follow the girl around, asking strange questions. He would obstruct her in her chores and generally make a mess of bothy. The maid desired to rid herself of this annoyance, but did not want to suffer the wrath of the other Urisks in the hills, who were known to be quite protective of their own. But on one day, she devised a devious scheme to rid herself of this unwanted guest. That day, she would finally tell the creature her name, a question which the she commonly asked. She told him that her name was me myself. The Urisk found it a curious name, but before he had time to ask any more questions, the maid threw a pan of scalding water over the poor creature. He sprang up from his seat, howling and crying, he ran back up the hill. When the other she asked who had done this to him, the Urisk replied, it was me myself. Thinking he had made a foolish mistake and burned himself, the others left their kin to treat his wounds, and the maid was never bothered again. I found that this story had a lot in common with a tale I told a while ago about creatures of the deep coming ashore on a small island. Not only that, but it mirrored parts of the Greek epic, the Odyssey, written by Homer, specifically the confrontation between Odysseus and the Cyclops Polyphemus. Odysseus tricked the Cyclops by telling him that his name was Nobody, later when the brave king of Ithaca blinded the Cyclops and made his escape. None of the other beasts would come to Polyphemus' aid, as when asked who attacked him, he claimed it to be nobody. Perhaps these tales are related in some manner, but the Odyssey seems to predate the others by quite some time. Then again, it's possible that they were just convergent ideas. My final tale of this interesting creature centers around a man known as Big Alistair. Big Alistair enjoyed nothing more than to fish in a local river. It was his great passion in life. Alistair, like any good fisher, knew that the fish would always bite quicker during the rain. So on one warm summer's night, when the rain began to pour, the Scotsman threw his fishing rod over his shoulder and headed with all haste to his favourite spot on the riverbank. It was so warm that night that Big Alistair could see a light mist forming all around him from the cold rain landing upon the warm riverbank. He got his rod in order and cast his hook out far into the centre of the river. The second the hook touched the water, a fish struck. Alistair had never before seen the fish take to the hook with such speed. He began to haul trout from the river at such a pace, there was not a moment to spare to put the fish in his bag. He barely had time to put the hook back in. So he continued to fish in this manner well into the night. Each time he caught a fish, he would throw it upon the grassy bank and quickly cast again. He was so preoccupied with the fish that he never noticed the strange goat-like creature standing next to him until he saw a second hook being cast and landing next to his. As Alistair looked to his side, there standing in the shallows of the river was a great urisk. Not only that, but the large beast had an equally large fishing rod and was catching the trout with the same speed Alistair had been only moments before. The Scotsman noticed that the Urisk was throwing his catch atop Alistair's pile at the back. There were no words between them, just a nod known by most fishermen. Then both the man and the creature continued to fish well into the early hours of the morning. It was during this time that Alistair became a little anxious of the Urisk. He had heard many tales of men that encountered strange beings in the woods at night, and not many of the stories had good endings. But Big Alistair also knew of the Urisk. They were simple folk and easily tricked. If he played this right, he could take all the fish for himself. The first light of morning was fast approaching, and Alistair knew the Urisk, like many other fake creatures, hated the dawn. All he had to do was wait. Not long after, the creature bellowed. It is time to stop Big Alistair and divide the fish. No, no, the man called. It is not at all time, especially while the fish are taken so well. The Urisk looked a little put off, but continued fishing. More time passed before the creature called again. Stop now, Big Alistair, and let us divide the fish. Have patience a little longer, replied Alistair. 
consider that I have never before seen the fish in such a taking humour. The Urus once again did what he was asked, although this time he was a lot more unwilling than the last, for he knew that day was fast approaching. Another few minutes went by, and the Urus called on Alistair for a third time, telling him to stop and divide the catch. The Scotsman knew from the tone in the beast's voice that he was getting angry, and it would not be wise to delay for much longer. Fine, fine, let's stop, said Alistair. Will you gather the fish or divide them? He questioned the creature. I shall gather them, and you shall divide them, spoke the beast with some authority. Ah, uh, that will not work, said Alistair, for I am unsure how to divide them. Flying into a fit of anger, the Urisk shouted loudly at the man. It's not difficult. One down and one up, one here and one there, and the last big one for me. Big Alistair now began to fear that the last big one might be himself. Perhaps the monster meant to eat him, along with the fish. First light was fast approaching, and if he could only stall for a short while, he would be safe. The man slowly set about sharing the fish. He was in no hurry to complete the task. He used every opportunity to delay the process. Alistair would constantly miscount, and many of the fish would slip from his hand. By this time, the Urisk was furious, stamping back and forth the bank with his cloven hooves. The beast finally cried out, half in anger and half in desperation. Won't you take care, big Alistair? Won't you take care? It seemed as if Alistair paid no attention to the pleas of the creature. But before long, the first rays of sunlight shone through the trees. The Urisk leapt onto a knoll above the river and quickly disappeared from sight. Big Alistair had won. He packed up the fish in a large bag and headed home. It is said, however, that from that day to the day of his death, Big Alistair never dared go fishing after nightfall. I think this last tale would show that on some occasions humans can be far crueler than the she. The Urisk is said to be a simple creature and was easily tricked or taken advantage of. In Scottish Gaelic, the term Urisk may also denote a diviner, a person with the abilities to foretell future events, although the word is also used to describe a savage-looking fellow. Some have suggested that the goat-like nature of the Urus may be in some form related to old nature spirits spoken of in the ancient Celtic mythology, which filled a similar role to the Roman faun or Greek satyr. Urisks are not only prevalent in the folklore of Scotland, but they are also found in many of the clan histories. The Highland clan of Graham claim that Urisks worked for their ancestors as servants. A similar tale was recorded by the clan MacLachlan, who were served by an Urisk who went by the name Harry, which was short for the Hairy One. There is an abundance of tales involving this creature all throughout Scottish history. All talk of similar looking creatures, but with vastly different attitudes and temperaments. I suppose it just goes to show that you cannot judge a creature by its form. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Um, so now that we have gone over um, kind of a brief explanation of a couple of the she from Ireland and um, the she from Scotland. Um, I was going to have, so we are running out of time, sadly, but I'm going to have everybody do a little like assignment before we leave and we end class for the night. Um, if you could write it down, if you want to, you could like write it down in the chat or just kind of think about it in your head. But I want you um, to kind of think about some of, okay, <clears throat> so for the assignment, the first thing I want you to do is write three things that you learned today about the Fae that you didn't know before. Um, and then also kind of your thoughts and opinions about the two different the two different types of she that you learned about tonight and what 
your thoughts and comments are and um, how maybe your opinion has changed about the Fae or also what kind of interest you have about further knowledge now that we've already kind of skimmed the surface of them some things what do you want to dive deeper into um so just if you could write a few sentences or just a little bit about that that would be awesome so three things that you learned today that you didn't know about and then some comments about what you're really excited to learn about in the next class that's going to happen next week and then also some comments about the phase that we learned about tonight and feel free to put that into the chat or feel free to just think about it in your head i'll give you a few minutes and you can share with your words or you can put it in the chat, whatever you are most comfortable with. And so I'm not just staring at you while you do this. <laughs> I will turn that off for a second. <laughs>
Wonderful. Thank you both so much for sharing. If you are still typing, please continue. Um, <clears throat> but yay, wonderful. I know. I really enjoy if you couldn't tell. I mean, obviously, you can always tell from people's teaching style kind of what they enjoy learning about. And I really enjoy the very specific stories and encounters from people. And so that's kind of what I wanted to start the class off with is that it was never just folklore. It was never just mythology. It was never just this idea that these creatures may or may not exist. It was the fact that people had become friends with these creatures. It was the fact that, like they said in the video, that chairs were sat by the fire for these creatures, that it wasn't just offerings being given, but that the creatures would come and eat the food and that they would. Um, participate in human life. That's what also kind of separates them from deities is the fact that they, they came to celebrate with humans. They were part of festivals. They were part of um, celebrations. They were part of feasting and part of their day-to-day -day life. They were part of their fishing journeys. They were part of their everyday lives and they became friends with the Fae. Um, that the more encounters that you look at, you know, the more you realize that these were friends of the people. They were beings that interacted and existed alongside humans, even if they had their own dimension and their own realm that they went to and existed in as well that they also existed very much so in the realm of humans and that some of them were bound to this world and that it existed solely in our dimension in our in our realm and um so i really hope that you enjoyed class today i know that we definitely just skimmed the surface if you already knew something about the faith, then just like EJ said, this was probably a lot of review for you. And we were just kind of jumping into stories that you've already heard and that you've already been very interested in. These were definitely very surface stories and very surface information. I cannot wait to dive deeper into this with you and to teach about just everything that I know about the Fae that the Celtic phase specifically. And thank you so much for being in class today. I had a lot of fun. I really hope that you enjoyed it. It sounds like both of you definitely learned new things today, even if it was just little things. And um, I can't wait for our next class. I have a lot planned. And next class too will be a lot more, um, there'll be a lot more participation as well because we are going to kind of, Obviously it's on Zoom, but physically practice some of the traditions and rituals surrounding the Celtic Bay. And so I can't wait to see you next time. And yeah, EJ is right. Um, the more we get into these, one of the things that you will realize, um, especially with stories like the Banshee and similar ones as well, um, a lot of these stories are not happy. The Fae are not always, it's not evil necessarily. I mean, there are definitely stories about Fae that didn't do nice things to people, but the backstories of the Fae themselves, some of them are really sad, very much like the Banshee and um, very depressing. And we are going to get into some pretty deep stuff. So I can't wait to see you next time. Um, thank you so much for being here. And I hope you guys have a wonderful night. You too. Thanks again. Oh, wow. Of course. <laughs> Thank you.